Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now proceed with our last session. Uh, this session is about disruptive innovation in education. So we have two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Mr. Michael Hong, uh, the head of strategy of uh, Entangled Group and also co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation. Uh, as you may know, uh, the late uh, Clayton Christensen uh, created the theory of uh, disruptive innovation as a professor at Harvard Business School. So, uh, Mr. Michael Hall, uh, the floor is yours. Kamsamnida and Anyang Haseo, Pangapsamnida to all of you uh, joining us uh, this evening in the United States uh, and over there during the day in Korea. As you may also know, uh, Clayton Christensen uh, had a deep connection uh, to Korea. He did his mission, uh, missionary work in Korea uh, several decades ago, uh, and it left a profound mark on him, even after he had uh, a stroke that harmed his ability to speak and read and things of that nature uh, before his recent passing. He could still communicate with my wife, who's Korean, uh, in Korean, and, and it held a very strong place uh, in his heart. And uh, I, of course, got to know uh, Lee Ju Ho when I came to Korea on my Eisenhower Fellowship, uh, and my wife and I lived there for some time studying the education system. So it holds a deep place uh, in our hearts, and, and appreciate you having me join you uh, today. What I thought I would do is talk about what is disruptive innovation more generally, uh, and then focus on uh, why does it matter in higher education, and what are various examples. The theory of disruptive innovation has become a very popular theory, very widely known, but it's also deeply misunderstood and misapplied. And when Professor Christensen came up with the theory, he meant something very specific by it, and so I thought I would start my conversation there with setting what is disruptive innovation and, and what is it not. Disruptive innovation is often confused as being the same as some sort of breakthrough innovation or giant leap forward, but in fact, disruptive innovations are those that take sectors that are characterized by things that are complicated, deeply inaccessible, deeply centralized, hard to use, and makes them far more affordable, convenient, accessible, and simple. The easy way to portray what this looks like is to imagine that there's a series of concentric circles. And what I want you to do is imagine that that innermost circle represents those people who have the most expertise or wealth in any given field. And that as you go out the successive circles, it represents people who have comparatively less money or less expertise. And what we see in most industries is that they get their start inside that innermost circle with products and services that are very expensive and very complicated and very inaccessible or centralized. And therefore, very few people can use them and most of us exist on these outer circles as non-consumers. And it's the process of disruptive innovation that decentralizes that world over time and allows many, many more of us uh, to become able to access more affordable products and services. So if you looked at computing, for example, before the advent of computers, we all, when we wanted to do computations or calculations, would take out a slide rule and do our com computations and calculations out in this outermost circle. But then it was the advent of the mainframe computer in the 1940s and 50s that really created the computing industry. And these machines were so expensive, they cost roughly $2 million to buy a mainframe computer. They were large, they would fill entire rooms, and they required deep expertise to be able to use them such that the majority of us existed in these outer circles as what we call non-consumers, literally unable to access, afford, or use the early computing machines. And then 
the process of disruptive innovation started to decentralize that world over time. First, there were the mini computers, still large machines that cost a quarter million dollars and very few people could still access or use them. But then the big disruptive innovation was in the form of the personal computer in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The first personal computers were primitive. They actually weren't all that great, which is another hallmark of disruptive innovation, which is that the innovations, as opposed to being some sort of breakthrough or giant leap forward, they actually are very primitive. They're not nearly as good as judged by the historical measures of performance on which we've thought about these services. And as a result, they literally can't start inside those inner circles. And instead, they start among non-consumers where all they have to do is be better than their alternative, which is nothing at all. So the early personal computers got their start among hobbyists and toys for children, people who literally couldn't afford a $2 million mainframe machine. And they were delighted with something that, yes, it was clunky, it wasn't that great, but it was better than their alternative, nothing at all. And the other hallmark of disruptive innovation is that powered by technology, it gets better year over year over year, such that what at one point is a primitive innovation becomes good enough to do complicated tasks and procedures and processes. And people in those inner circles, they rapidly migrate out to the disruptive innovation as they're delighted by a product or service that's far more affordable, convenient, accessible, simple, and is good enough for what they need. True, it's still not as good as the most uh, cutting edge products and services inside that innermost circle, but it's good enough for what the majority of them need. Even today, there's obviously people who still use mainframe computers and probably won't ever stop. They need all that performance. But the majority of us have moved out to machines that are accessible and affordable and plenty good enough for us. And we've seen this disruptive innovation continue with laptops and then handheld phones. Indeed, you can tell this story in sector after sector of how disruptive innovation has transformed it by replacing the dominant products and companies of the time innovations that are far more affordable, accessible, and simple. They've even lifted whole economies. And so you can tell the story of, on that front line, of that top line of how the American automakers, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, were disrupted by the Japanese automakers, Toyota, Honda, and so forth. What's interesting is that Toyota didn't start at the high end with Lexuses. They started the low end with crummy cars called Coronas. They rusted awfully quick. They weren't all that great. But for people that couldn't afford the gas-guzzling cars that Detroit was manufacturing, they were better than the alternative, nothing at all. And then they got better and better from the Coronas. They went up market to the Tercels, and then the Corollas, Camrys, Forerunners, Avalons, and then the Lexus and changed the world. Now, here's the other thing about disruptive innovation, which is from the perspective of Ford and General Motors, they saw these folks from Toyota coming. And every once in a while, they'd say, you know, we really ought to go out to that outer circle and compete with those buggers. And so they'd send out a Pinto or a Chevette. But when they compared the margins of selling one of those vehicles with the ability to continue to go up market and push out another Ford Explorer or a Cadillac Escalade, it just made sense to make bigger products that they could charge more money for in the ways that they had historically made money. And so they ceded more and more ground to the Japanese automakers and Toyota. And by the uh, early 2000s, had fully become disrupted. And of course, bank, uh, bankruptcy and bailouts awaited them. And even today, what's interesting is that the American automakers make very few passenger cars. The vast majority of what they manufacture are SUVs, trucks, and things of that nature that are bigger and so forth, and they've seeded that market. Now, of course, it's not just the Japanese that have used disruptive innovation to power their economy through the likes of Toyota, Sony, uh, Compaq, and the like, but Korea has played this game as well. 
Hyundai and Kia have been disrupting Toyota for the last many years. 15 years ago, people laughed at the quality in many cases of the Korean automobiles, and today, Koreans win many of the quality awards and do so often more affordably. Samsung, uh, LG, and so forth have lifted the Korean economy to unparalleled prosperity that Clay Christensen could only have dreamed about when he lived uh, in Korea. And so we see this process play itself out. Now, the question, of course, is how does this relate to higher education? And to be candid, for a long time, disruptive innovation did not have any bearing on higher education. Indeed, if you looked at the innermost circle, and I'm just going to use the United States as an example here, you would have seen Harvard University, perhaps, or Yale, MIT, uh, places like that in the center circle. You then had decentralization, where the Land Grant Act started to create state-based universities like the University of Massachusetts that extended more access uh, to uh, students to be able to go to higher education who didn't have access before. But there was no technology enabler that allowed the University of Massachusetts to disrupt Harvard. They came in with a more affordable, more accessible offering that served uh, and decentralized the industry, but it did not disrupt it. And then we saw community colleges further decentralize higher education, but not disrupt it. And it's only been in the last couple of decades that we've seen a technology enabler in online learning that has the potential to actually disrupt uh, higher education and start to change the equation in some fundamental ways. And indeed, online learning in the United States is growing in line with that as institutions like Southern New Hampshire, like Western Governors University, have, have paired online learning with fundamentally disruptive business models that create lower price, more accessible offerings that serve many, many more people, and by the way, are getting better and better and better year over year over year. And now, uh, according to current statistics in the United States, roughly a third of students take at least one online course as part of their higher education or post-secondary studies. And uh, a full 15% of students are fully online. If you look at graduate studies where disruptive innovation, I would argue, has been most apparent, uh, roughly 30% of students are now, uh, of master's students, are fully online, and we continue to see the disruption grow. Now, there's an interesting test just to understand uh, if something is disruptive, and, and I put the six uh, uh, questions that all have to be true for there to really be something disruptive. But the first is, is the innovation targeting people who are non-consumers or who are overserved by the existing products and services? That is, all that the uh, existing products or services, they cost so much money, and they're offering things that ultimately I'm not willing to pay for, and I start looking for other options. The second thing is, is the innovation not as good as the existing services as judged by the historical measures of performance. So I would argue in the case of Southern New Hampshire University, for example, they are fundamentally redefining performance around questions of teaching and learning and placement into good jobs and economic mobility and things of that nature, as opposed to the traditional metrics of, of American higher education, which have been based around the quality of research, the selectivity of institutions, and things of that nature. The third question is, is the innovation simpler to use, more convenient, or more affordable? And so this points to the, that you can't just be offering the new technology in the traditional model, as many uh, institutions of higher education have done in the United States. They've gone online, but they've maintained the expensive price, selectivity, things of that nature and not fundamentally offered something that's more convenient and affordable and accessible. The fourth one is, is there a technology enabler that, as I said, can carry the new value proposition up market? And I want to be clear here, as I see Southern New Hampshire University and Western Governors University and institutions like them in the United States that are offering more affordable, convenient, in some cases faster programs, um, I don't think they're going to 
disrupt a place like Harvard? Because I think the other piece of disruptive innovation is that uh, services that create quality by excluding people based on their exclusivity, based on their selectivity, based on becoming luxury products, they are disrupted. But I would argue that the mass of institutions like regional comprehensive universities or small private liberal arts institutions in the United States that are not selective are at very grave risk. And so in the Korean context, for instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, Seoul National University or Yonsei or KAIST, probably not at risk, but potentially in the longer run, and it's not a, an event, it's a process, you could imagine a lot of other institutions that cover and serve other students uh, perhaps struggling to adapt to disruptive innovations that come in with far more affordable, convenient, and accessible offerings. They can get better and better year over year at serving a broader swath of students with more complicated challenges. The fifth question is, is this technology paired with a business model and innovation that allows it to be sustainable? And so in the United States and much of the world uh, several years ago, there was a craze around MOOCs, massive open online courses, uh, and I would submit those were not disruptive uh, for a few reasons, one of which was they didn't have a business model innovation that allowed it to be sustainable over time because they were free. And then the last question is, are the existing providers actually motivated to ignore the new innovation and not threatened at the outset? And that's been clearly the case uh, with many online offerings that are more affordable, convenient, and don't look or feel like traditional higher education. They often have different faculty models, different support structures for students and things of that nature that fundamentally reset the equation. Now, a big question, of course, is as COVID-19 has spread around the globe and shuttered the physical campuses uh, for many universities around the world, and universities have had to go online, what, what's going to happen in the years ahead uh, with this disruptive innovation? Even more to the point, frankly, I think mobile learning is emerging as a disruptive innovation below online learning. What's going to be the effect of, of this uh, disease uh, on, that, that has forced colleges and universities that did not want to go online? What's going to be the impact on this? And my sense is that two things are true simultaneously. On the one hand, uh, I think because institutions that have been so resistant to online learning in their core operations are moving so rapidly without the support and structure and thoughtfulness uh, and preparation for their faculty, a lot of students are going to be experiencing some very challenged, subpar, uh, suboptimal experiences that are not great. And many faculty, I think, will be disgruntled and put off by these experiences. And so I'm actually, in the short term, think that this move might actually not be that great for online education's reputation because there will be a lot of bad experiences offered. At the same time, and particularly if this uh, uh, pandemic lasts longer and causes uh, more social distancing or physical distancing for longer duration, uh, than perhaps we've seen to this point, in that it causes campuses not to have students come back maybe in the fall and so forth, then I think you could see many students start to say, well, if we're going to be online, why would I pay these high premium prices uh, for a residential experience or a, co uh, a physical experience that I'm not getting? Why not look to a provider that actually knows how to do online learning well, has a lot of experience and expertise in it, and can do it more affordably and the like, and create a range of new experiences? And then it actually will fuel the growth of the native online providers that have set up business models to do this explicitly. They've carved out places to do online learning well and invest in it. And my sense is that the longer this stretches on, uh, the more this advantages those providers uh, and creates an advantage for them. The third thing that I think uh, is also true is that institutions are now going to have to take online learning much more seriously as a disaster preparedness measure. 
in Singapore, if you look back uh, over a decade ago, when uh, SARS and the avian flu and so forth uh, uh, came out, uh, occurred, they started to take some very strong measures to have online learning or e-learning weeks where students would stay home and not go to school and, and practice a, a disaster preparedness scenarios. I think all institutions are going to have to invest much more robustly uh, in a variety of plans that contemplate both online scenarios as well as, frankly, offline scenarios in case of cybersecurity hacking and things of that nature that contemplate remote learning in a variety of ways uh, to deal with potential interruptions in the years ahead, uh, whether it's from pandemics, natural disasters, cybersecurity challenges, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, and, but they're going to have to take online learning much more seriously as part of that. And regardless of short-term faculty negative reaction to bad experiences, over time I think uh, they will invest more seriously, which will strengthen the online offerings and strengthen the technologies and research and development uh, that is done in this sector, which I think will propel online learning to new heights and ultimately cause more disruptive innovation uh, in higher education that will serve many, many more students uh, in, in countries in a variety of circumstances when they're still employed through lifelong learning pathways and the like that help them step it up in their lives, extend themselves, uh, and, and so forth in very fruitful ways. So that's an overview uh, of disruptive innovation in higher education. Hopefully gives you a sense of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, how we start to see it playing out, and the potential for it to extend access and redefine what quality and value is in some very exciting ways uh, that uh, I, I, I hope are uh, helpful. So thank you so much, and, and I'll turn it back to you. Excellent presentation. Uh, now uh, I will introduce our second speaker. Uh, this is uh, Kent Green, uh, Deputy, Deputy Director of Learning Science at uh, Southern New Hampshire University Innovation Center. Uh, SNHU is regarded as one of the world's most innovative and largest universities with over 130,000 students in the uh, Mr. Kathleen, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to be part of today's forum. It is truly an honor to be here with you all virtually. Um, it's also a great privilege to be sharing the virtual stage with you, Michael. Um, Southern New Hampshire University has collaborated often with the Entangled Group, and of course, um, we have a had historically a wonderful relationship as well with Professor Christensen, our university president, Paula Blank, is was great friends with Professor Christensen and his body of work on disruptive innovation has informed several of our innovations at Southern New Hampshire University. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be sharing with you today. I'd like to start with introducing you to myself and telling you a little bit about the work that I do at Southern New Hampshire University. My name is Kat Flynn. I'm the Deputy Director of Learning Science at Southern New Hampshire University, or SNHU as we call it, Innovation Center. I'm very proud to be here representing SNHU, speaking to you about disruptive innovation in higher education. My talk today is going to focus on the work the department I'm part of, the Innovation Center does, to help orient our university to the needs of the future learner. Hence today's talks focus on the world of work and learning in 2030. I am very lucky to have been at SNHU since 2014 and been with the university through a large period of its growth. It's been an incredible journey to see the university grow in the short amount of time I've been in there, considering its larger history since 1932. I began my career at SNHU designing online courses with faculty as an instructional designer at our global campus, at the time called the College of Online and Continuing Education. 
my next role at the university was working with a team to manage online learning quality across our course catalog. And these days at the SNHU Innovation Center, I work as a learning scientist, a researcher. My role focuses on how do people learn, how do they learn most effectively, and how can we as a university create learning experiences that help all learners achieve their full potential. As anyone at our university will tell you, we are driven by our mission of transforming lives through education. Our president, Paula Blank, says that opportunity is evenly distributed, but oftentimes opportunity is not. We see innovation as an engine to ac expand access to education for our learners. Thinking about how can we connect those talented people out there to the opportunities they may not be able to access. And so built on the foundation of an existing internal consultancy unit within SNHU, the Innovation Center was formally established in January of 2019. So we're a very new group within the university, but we are here and we're ready to help the university meet the needs of the future learner. At SNHU, we take a very disciplined approach to innovation. Our thought is to blend creativity with strategy. As we work toward understanding how technology and how society impact the future of education, it changes how we understand how people learn and what we do to teach students. Innovation really challenges us to think beyond the norms of today in order to cultivate the practices of tomorrow. And innovation, as we think about it, is something that's really both a mindset and a method through which an organization remains competitive and relevant to the demands of the market. We're thinking that we innovate so that we may solve our learners' most difficult problems and imagine learning experiences for in which some cases, like the technology, the processes, and the competencies themselves have really yet to be invented. So we've got to be future thinking in creating learning solutions for our learners. And to give you an idea how we do all this work at the Innovation Center to help position the university for the future learner, here's a quick visual showing how our team is organized. We produce innovative solutions with four components, concepts, process innovations, technology innovations, and competency innovations. As such, there are four units within our Innovation Center team. There's a group called the Sandbox, and they're responsible for generating, conceptualizing new ideas. There's a group called the Innovation Management Office. They're responsible for managing process innovations, emerging innovations. There's also a research and development group, SNHU Labs. That's the team that I'm part of within the Innovation Center, and we're responsible for testing new technology solutions. There are also teams dedicated throughout the university to incubating new concepts. The Innovation Center is led by our Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer who reports to our President and CEO, and he is responsible for communicating, executing, and sustaining strategic projects. He also manages the corporate process of innovation, change management, and strategic planning at SNHU, in addition to directing all projects within the Innovation Center. And we at the Innovation Center are really established to be a resource and support system for our university leadership, faculty, and staff. We offer strategic intelligence and research and development, and our goal here is really to clarify problems for teams that they are experiencing and help work with them to develop solutions that work now as well as into the future. And while we have a dedicated innovation center at SNHU, I really want to emphasize that at Southern New Hampshire University, we believe every single person is an innovator. We are a service unit to others throughout SNHU, and our goal is to provide support to our innovators who work most closely with our students. And when I'm saying this, I want you to think about the advisors who spend time regularly interacting directly with our online learners. These are the people who are know our learners best and they know their individual struggles and they cheer them on with their individual triumphs. 
really in order to understand the needs of the future learner and what disruptive innovations are going to best meet their needs, we've got to understand the challenges faced by the learner of today. So what challenges do today's learners face? I think we all have some sense of this today, but it really does bear repeating. There are an incredible number of challenges our learners seek as they try to further their education. In addition to trying to earn a degree or a credential, they're working through a multitude of current forces, things like financial challenges, the looming threat of employment displacement due to automation, um, their perceived confidence in the education system, and they're also trying to retain some semblance of balance between their work life and their home life. And of course, there are any number of unexpected challenges life might throw their way. And the present moment is just but one layer of this. We also have to factor in the fact that today's barriers can either be helped or hindered by the forces and challenges presented by the future. So that brings us back to the future, so to speak. And you might recognize this quote from the earlier presentation by Dale Johnson, and it's absolutely worth repeating because it's a good one. The future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. At this talk, I mentioned something about our team at the SNHU Innovation Center, focusing our work on the learner of 2030. Now at this point, or you might've been wondering all along, why the year 2030? why that particular year. And our thought here in choosing the year 2030 is that we don't wanna to be too, too close to the present day. Everyone has their own opinion on what five years, for example, from now will look like. A lot of people have a five year plan, their values and beliefs might get in the way, and five years could go by just debating what the year 2025 would even look like. And then again, on the flip side, we don't wanna be thinking too far out. Something like the year 2050 gets us into the realm of science fiction. We really have found in our work that looking at the year 2030 strikes the right balance for us. The conversations we can have are a lot richer and we have access to folks who will be students in 2030. That current group of nine to 10 year olds, these are my coworkers' children, these are, people that we know in the community already. All the technology that will factor into the mix is here out there in some way or another. It's just not everywhere yet. The future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And of course, it's likely there won't be too many huge shifts in the policy landscape between now and 2030. Back in college, I spent a lot of time studying literature immersing myself in that practice of critically reading books, deriving deeper meaning from poetry and novels. In a similar fashion, we can critically read the world of today for signals that indicate the innovations of tomorrow. So in the middle picture, right here in the middle, is a device called the Double. It's a telepresence robot, if you're not familiar with it, that entered the market back in 2013. Prior to 2013, a lot of signals indicating the development of this robot were there. There were things like iPads, Segways, Roombas, and video messaging, video conferencing in one way or another. They were just unevenly distributed. And these signals brought to bear an innovation that served an unmet need. The need for employees working remotely to connect physically have a physical presence with their colleagues in the main office. Thanks to the convergence of these signals, now we can bring in colleagues from different locations to the main office and let them unnerve their coworkers a little bit by driving a robot through the office. And yet another example of distributed signals. Today's smartphone is built off the signals of yesterday. Looking at all these items that used to be loaded into a big knapsack, the watch, the credit card, the heavy wallet, with the cash and the bulky cell phone and the bulky camera. Today, all these things have converged into a single small device that can be fit in the pocket and for most of us really is like our third hand. 
also we have to think of critically about signals from our young people, those who will be both our adult and more traditional 18 to 22 year old learners in the year 2030, Generation Z and Generation Alpha. They're here today and they have a lot to say about what they expect for their future, what they expect out of their educational experiences. And as innovators and educators, we've got to listen to them and have their voices help us understand how can we create the right learning solutions for the future. Okay, so if we're to innovate educational solutions that put our learner, our present and our future learners at the center of a learning ecosystem, we've got to shift our thinking. Change is inevitable, even more so now than ever. At the Innovation Center, we're challenged to use the futures thinking to put innovation into perspective. So I'll give you some examples of what I mean here. So thinking about what does happens when organizations don't think differently, when they don't put their customer at the center of their ecosystem. Something like the example of Blockbuster. The streaming technology of Netflix itself did not kill Blockbuster. Charging people late fees for returning a video two, three days late did. It wasn't central to the life of that person to return a video on the time. They got busy. And the company was not thinking about that life experience first. They're thinking about their policies first. Or the example of the music and recording industry and how iTunes overtook the traditional CD business, right? People only wanted 13, excuse me, people only wanted one or two out of 15 songs on an album, forcing them to buy the whole thing just doesn't make sense. And the list goes on and on. And we've really got to understand that the technology itself is not the disruptor. Not being customer centric or in our case as a university, learner centric is the biz biggest threat out there to any organization. So the conversations we have with young people today about what they expect for college, what they expect for their future learning experiences is very different, right? Because these young people live in what we think of as a VUCA world. And VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And this is the world, this is the landscape our learners live in now. And as innovators, as educators, as leaders, this is what we have to live and breathe too in order to best understand their future and put forth the right innovations to serve their needs. So one way that we operationalize signals and we operationalize this understanding of VUCA is we use future forces, which are patterns of change that are likely to disrupt today's way of doing things. And these future forces may come from innovations and in technologies, policies, markets, and cultures. These future forces drive the emergence of grand challenges, which may either present themselves as barriers or opportunities for those impacted. And future, excuse me, in future forces like these, such patterns of change challenge us to think beyond today's best practices in order to help us as innovators create the wisdom of tomorrow. Today at the SNHU Innovation Center, we have identified five forces that will shape the landscape that learners and workers will navigate in 2030. So these five forces are human machine collaboration, how might artificial intelligence and machine learning challenge us to develop the skills and ethics needed to work side by side in human machine teams? Personal economies, how might the rise of digital platforms challenge people to fashion their own economic opportunities? Spectrum demographics, how might spectrum identities replace traditional demographics, enable highly personalized services, and change how people manage their reputations. Shape-shifting organizations. How might distributed computing challenge organizations to redesign themselves to maximize human value in a world undergoing rapid change? And finally, masterminds of reality. How might the Internet of Things enable us to simulate everything and challenge us to integrate simulation literacy into daily practice?
Now, we do not think these are the only challenges that our future learners will face. Even as we deepen our understanding of these forces and their implications, we will continue to scan social, technological, economic, ecological, and political systems for the signals and trends that can improve our understanding of the emerging future. So now I'll just give you a little bit of more information on each of our future forces that we look like, we look at. So intelligent systems, the proliferation of intelligent systems all around the world with processing speeds that will far outpace human processing, vast stores of data that could overwhelm human minds and globally connected sensors that bring their intelligence into the physical world, this proliferation will challenge learners, workers, and managers of organizations to develop finely honed skills in human-machine collaboration. One example of this in action among many, um, there was a robot at the advertising firm McCann, and they were hired as a creative director. And then the firm hosted a contest between the human creative directors and the robot in order to demonstrate the robot, robot's competence. And I believe the robot did quite well. Distributed computing. The disruption of disrupt, distributed computing, often using blockchain technologies to manage transactions, contracts, and even organizational priorities will amplify the potential of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. This will challenge organizations to become facilitators of such transactions in the landscape of shape-shifting organizations and its mission. One example of this in action is called WINGS. It's a Kickstarter-like platform for creating decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs, with a community of token holders who vote on proposed projects, and they vote based on which projects will have the best chance of success. And the individual token holders actually earn forecast ratings based on their votes. The expansion of platform economies that build on application programming interfaces or APIs to enable one service to build upon another will challenge individuals to build their own personal economies by fashioning their own economic opportunities, income, and value streams. So something like this in action is a platform called Personal Tokens. This helps individuals issue their personal initial coin offerings or ICOs that tap into the growth of the digital currency markets which will be key to financial success in the future. Uh, the force of international markets, the uh, evolution of international markets alongside large scale human migration will blur the multitude of conventional demographic and ethnic boundaries in the future. This will be challenging everyone to replace those concept demographic segments with new practices built on emerging demographic spectrums. And we'll see Various innovations come from um, some of the poorest regions in the world. One of, example of this in action is a platform called Acrobatic that's built on a science-based methodology for course design. And it uses predictive analytics to deliver personalized learning experiences to students to match their learning needs. So when we're thinking about this world of 2030, what people are going to expect, they're really going to expect personalization tailored to their individuality, their individual learning needs, their individual identities, things like that. And as we also think toward 2030, the emergence of futures literacy will play a role. So in a world where rapid technological advancements intersect with global social upheaval, that's gonna to continue to create volatility and uncertainty. It'll challenge the world to build skills in simulating urgent futures and their solutions. Hence, masterminds of reality. So being able to think in terms of simulation, that gaming mindset that we see a lot of people, a lot of younger people especially bring to the table, that's gonna become more and more important. One example of this you might be familiar with is called Spatial OS. It's a cloud computing service for building virtual worlds, including actual cities and biological ecosystems. Uh, it was acquired by Google, and it's offered as an open system. It demonstrates the practical link between gameplay and simulation and game design and real systems modeling. So we're going to see all those things come into convergence. 
So we're thinking about the future. And one thing we have to bear in mind about this kind of futures thinking that we take on at the Innovation Center that we take on into our practice as innovators is that every useful statement about the future seems a little ridiculous at first, and it is a big shift in our thinking. But I would invite you to think about examples of some of the most innovative companies out there, things like Netflix or Apple. At first, when we heard about the concepts for those companies, I bet some of us were a bit skeptical and a bit incredulous. So that's just something worth bearing in mind that at first the future sounds ridiculous until it becomes real. So as I close, there are a couple of things I'd like for you to bear in mind as we continue our discussion together. As educators, as innovators, as leaders, we're all together in this game of hope. I'm here doing what I'm doing, and I imagine you're also doing what you're doing in order to try to make the world a better place. Given the current state of the world, hope is more important than ever. So let's all do what we can to innovate the best possible learning solutions to expand access to learning for all and keep our young people hope hopeful. And finally, the work we do in our various sectors is really tough, but it's more important than ever. I think we've got to keep hope in mind, but we've also got to keep remembering the following as we in innovate. As we think ahead to that learner of 2030, those nine to 10 year olds, where they're at today, they are living in the epitome of a VUCA world. I think we can all agree, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. This is all very, very relevant. And there's quite a good chance that this young person's future job or career doesn't exist yet. And it's the choice we make today as leaders, innovators, education, educators, to actively engage with those signals from the future that are here today that will help us innovate learning experiences that maximize the success, the chance of success for all. Thank you so much for allowing me to share and I'm very excited to be part of our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kathleen, for your excellent presentation. Uh, could you just can I just make a quick question about your slides? Could you uh, come back to the slide uh, about the uh, the uh, the sandbox and on, on the left hand side and the the, uh, the incubator on the right hand side? The, the slide about what you do in uh, innovation center. Could you show us the slide? Yes, yes. So could you be more specific about what you do here? So could you just uh, provide some examples uh, of uh, what, so it's really about the, uh, the change in how you teach and how students are learning, right? So yeah, what I... kind of innovation do you have through this uh, innovation center uh, impacting on how you teach and how students learn? I'd be happy to share. To provide further context, we're a center of about 40 employees at the university. Um, we focus on research and development work. Our focus, our main charge is on conceptualizing that learning ecosystem of 2030. So a lot of us aren't as heavily involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the university. However, we are thought partners with those who are in the day-to-day -day operations. We believe it's really important to have that pulse on what's next, on what future learners are going to expect. To provide you with some specific examples, I am part of the SNHU Labs team. We are in charge of testing new technology solutions, research and development work. One example of the work we're involved in is testing virtual reality as a teaching tool in today's classroom. So this semester, we partnered with a psychology professor on our physical campus to design virtual reality learning experiences and test those experiences with students. Um, another example is our Google.org grant-funded project called the Future Employment Assessment Tool 
looking at how we can use digital badges to credential soft skills that young people can share with employers. Other work we're focused on, we're looking at, goodness, Um, the global. Guy assisted learning. Oh, sorry. What about AI, what about AI assisted learning? AI you assisted learning. AI, AI and uh, online learning platform for this uh, uh, seminar. And uh, are there any examples you can learn about utilizing AI or learning platforms? Yes, absolutely. So I think personalized learning is something where very, very interested in at our global campus already. We've deployed personalized adaptive learning solutions. Um, some of our courses use that Alex learning solution that uh, Dale Johnson shared earlier. Those are things we're looking at. We're really working to envision a future learning ecosystem that is learner centric that leverages the best of all available technology to converge discrete, previously discrete separate pieces of the university system and bring them together for the learner to meet their needs. Thanks for your sharing. So uh, let me, let us turn to uh, the, the, the uh, panel. We have, uh, South Korea also have uh, very innovative universities. Uh, uh, so I'm very happy to have uh, two uh, presidents from two most, two most innovative universities in Korea. Uh, President uh, Sun, uh, Sun Hung Jang of Handong University and President uh, Jae Jang of uh, Dongsa University. So uh, let me first ask President uh, Sun Hung Jang, uh, please, uh, we have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed the uh, speech of the microphone and the canteen. So I'm, uh, you know, uh, first I'd like to say, okay, uh, disruption is already here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Disruption in education is already here, especially because of the Corona crisis. <laughs> so the, uh, our university started, uh, you know, uh, online uh, education about three weeks ago. Yeah. Our university is uh, first, you start first. But uh, <coughs> right now, already many, many professors and many students, they all, already like the uh, online education rather than offline. Yeah. So, that's, uh, so already disruption is here. Uh, especially students like the online because uh, they can utilize time more flexibly, and they can sleep late. And uh, <coughs> okay, so now, now uh, so but until three years ago, okay, professor, some of professors dislike online education, and uh, some students dislike. But now, now the many professor, most of professor and most of student like uh, start to like the online education. That's the sudden change because of uh, Corona crisis. And, uh, but uh, today, <coughs> so in the future, uh, how you uh, must make a balance online and offline education? Yeah? That's, uh, you know, our important uh, task. Uh, but uh, uh, new technology like artificial intelligence, you contribute a lot in the uh, education. That's my uh, uh, prospect. Uh, personally, uh, I'd like to emphasize this. In higher education or education, two capabilities are very important, whether it goes online or offline. First uh, capability is uh, self-learning capability, and self-learning capability. And the uh, second capability is uh, problem solving capability. Yeah. Problem solving capability. These two, if the student are equipped with these two capabilities, then you know, uh, 
the essence of the education is a component. So uh, first, I will talk about the self learning capability. Because uh, in right now, uh, you are uh, my philosophy behind self learning capability is like this: teach less, learn more. Yeah, that's very important uh, philosophy. So our uh, teachers and professor help the student learn the self-learning capability yeah, guide. So maybe in the future, artificial intelligence, like already artificial intelligence contribute, but the uh, artificial intelligence uh, must develop software which can give the self-learning in many, many areas, language, mathematics, and physics, and engineering, and uh, even business. So, uh, artificial intelligence uh, will make the uh, big difference uh, compared to now. And in the future, you will have the uh, good software and good tools for self learning. So, from now on, and the university and some uh, software company develop together uh, self learning tools in the many, many subjects. That's important. Then it will make the nearly uh, disruptive disruption in education. Yeah? Cheap, convenient, and accessible. Yeah? Uh, so that's the, you know, uh, I like to emphasize. Uh, so AI will make the uh, self learning. Uh, and AI will help self-learning. And uh, for this, you will make uh, a joint effort. That's the you know, important goal of the future education. And uh, another one is the uh, problem solving capability. Especially I like to talk about the problem finding and the problem solving capability. This is very important. So many, uh, you know, uh, Studies say, okay, in the future, most important capability is the problem finding and the problem solving capability. So, uh, my university, uh, ever since I become the president, I emphasize, emphasize the problem, uh, project based lecture, PBL or problem based lecture. So, I strongly push our uh, professor uh, to uh, Toward the problem-based uh, lectures, so the so you you need the so I already uh, you know uh, asked our pro, uh, so professor and student ten project ten important project so uh, it's uh, you know uh, local uh, development and uh, national development and also uh, worldwide development so. Also, you know, has related project as a, uh, you know, force artificial intelligence oriented economy and uh, many, many uh, important ones. But I somewhat on time project. Anyway, I strongly encourage our professors to go with the problem uh, PBR. But the, I emphasize the, uh, also problem finding. Most important thing is I ask our professor to help the student put problems. What's the problems? What's the problems uh, in the uh, local problems and the national problems and the global problems? That's the, so problem finding is important. And also important thing is that these days, uh, problem, defining problem is important. What's the real essence of problem? problem defining capability. So uh, in the future, artificial if you define problem very well, artificial intelligence help the solution. So already uh, in, in as you know the in Go, so artificial intelligence is much better than you know world champion. So 
the capability is important, the most important capability is the problem definition. How to define the problem, AI can help you. So that's the uh, important thing. So I, uh, in the future, for better uh, future disruption of the education, you need the uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools to help the self-learning capability, especially adaptive self-learning capability, and problems finding and solve solving capability. That's the, uh, my uh, comment. And uh, what, one thing I'd I like to say is um, in the future, uh, I'm working at the traditional university. Yeah. But the, in, in the future, you can uh, imagine some university without campus, without professors, already uh, Minerva University don't have campus, mm -hmm. and the uh, Apple 42 in France, Paris, they don't have professors. Mm -hmm. So, in the future, you can expect that many, you know, uh, ex extraordinary university will happen. Then, what's the relation between the traditional university and the ordinary university? Like the Minerva, but the, that's the uh, but the future. Uh, some people ask me, traditional university disappears, but I would say never, because two things. <laughs> yeah, one is uh, because of rent. Yeah, yeah. So you, you know, even though the most of the bag uh, and most of the bag is just you know ten dollars, but the but people say the very expensive bag, like the Shanghai, you know, high brand. So maybe because of brand, traditional university will survive. <laughs> so Harvard, good name, MIT, or Stanford, they will survive because of high brand. Another one is, uh, okay, even though you have the good access uh, of the education, cheap and convenient, but uh, most of the uh, students are very late, even though very cheap access, because they don't, you know, study, because of their laziness. So because of laziness and uh, <laughs> the, because of the brand, I think the traditional university continue to yeah. survive, maybe utilizing some high technology, that's the, you know, by just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, President Sanchez. Uh, we will turn to uh, the uh, President Dan Debu. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, and I truly enjoyed the chat and uh, Michael's uh, presentation, uh, very insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to talk about uh, some of the limitations and opportunities of uh, disruptive innovation in education. Uh, nowadays, everyone is talking about uh, innovation, uh, as you mentioned. And borrowing from the lexicon of the business sector, uh, they are even talking about, you know, they're using the expression uh, disruptive innovation. I, and then um, I believe today's topic is also uh, named as such. Um, though we use this term rather freely, um, the question of how to realize this innovative uh, innovation or um, disruptiveness seems to require a great deal of discussion. First, uh, as you all agree, um, the education industry is known for um, very conservative <coughs> stance, you know, very conservative. So in general, the field uh, does not welcome changes uh, with open arms. Uh, you know, we experience that very much. Uh, we take a higher education, uh, as you, if we usually take a, a higher education as an example, uh, we might uh, ask this question. Is it possible for a university president like me or President uh, Chan uh, to persuade his or her uh, faculty members to change their teaching style or methodology or to incorporate you know, high tech into their lectures? Uh, the answer may be negative uh, in most of the cases. In fact, 
faculty members uh, really enjoy you know, independence, uh, which may be uh, the third reason why they chose this uh, specific profession. Uh, they uh, strong, uh, strongly believe that the profession should provide autonomy and the freedom not to be impinged uh, upon by others. And second, uh, everybody's talking about the post-industrial revolution and the people are becoming increasingly familiar with the new terms such as big data, artificial intelligence, and gig economy, and the cryptocurrency, and etc. But when it comes to uh, utilizing these technologies, uh, it's a quite different story. Um, educators usually are not trained at all in terms of uh, technology usage. For example, during the, uh, the past uh, several weeks in Korea, everything was moving to uh, online. Uh, and you know, there was a huge gap between what is available in terms of uh, state of art uh, information technology and uh, its practical use. So all the universities in Korea uh, suffered a lot because of that, because some, uh, a lot of offline universities were not ready to go online. Uh, so a lot of uh, faculty members faced considerable difficulty creating online materials due to lack of uh, training and also understanding of this mechanism. So, but you know, tech uh, savvy, uh, you know, digital native students uh, immediately noticed and uh, complained about their professors' clumsy <laughs> use of, uh, you know, uh, this seemingly simple online uh, you know, system and that negatively impacted on uh, the class quality. And third, why the, uh, the world is disruptive, sounds fashionable, and uh, draws a great deal of attention, the existing uh, legal and regulatory uh, environment does not necessarily welcome such a move. In Korea, for example, uh, offline universities like us, and traditional universities, face uh, regulation limiting the percentage of online uh, uh, lectures to 20% of the total. So according to Korean law, uh, Korean laws institutions must have uh, sizable physical buildings and facilities in order to qualify as a university. Uh, as, a, uh, as President Chang mentioned, the Minerva School, uh, it doesn't have any campus. There are no physical lecture rooms available at Minerva because the world is uh, itself is their campus. Uh, also, uh, you know, Minerva is well known as one of the leading examples of disruptive educational institution. Would it be possible uh, you know, to establish such a university in Korea? Uh, as long as we have such a you know, stiff and uh, uh, you know, uh, stiff regulations, it will remain difficult to disrupt the current uh, educational model. So I think you know, um, that uh, leaves us uh, you know, with uh, the status quo unless we are able to um, come up with uh, rather bold solutions to overcome these obstacles. I mentioned about three points. One is how to ameliorate educators' mindsets and attitudes toward disruptiveness. And second, how to effectively train and uh, uh, make the educators adaptable to and comfortable with uh, state-of-art technologies. And third, how to uh, roll back the existing stiff rules and regulations. As you can imagine, you know, none of these seems to be uh, you know, easy tasks. Um, ironically, however, um, the current coronavirus uh, outbreak provided us with an unusual opportunity to talk about the need for uh, changes in current educational model. It forced us to uh, uh, diagnose our education environment, or even the state of 21st century humanity, uh, through an X-ray. Uh, first, coronavirus uh, incident is clear warning against the, uh, humanity's relentless pursuit of greed. Uh, of course, we are not, not sure yet uh, what really uh, caused uh, this pandemic. Uh, many points out uh, points to uh, consumption of wild animals uh, as the cause. People have been eating these, you know, uh, wild animals uh, in the hope of uh, increasing their stamina, and mm -hmm. some have identified bats or pangolins as the cause of the pandemic. But I think, in my opinion, the real uh, culprit is the human greed. Humanity's endless greed and vanity are destroying the this uh, environment and running counter to uh, nature's uh, progress. So I think we need to disrupt it uh, in what we are teaching and in what we emphasize in education. So under the pretext of a physical, uh, practical society, we have been putting too much focus on uh, cutting-edge knowledge and skills. And 
and the less on character building education. So the more selfish human beings are produced, the more society will succumb to greed. Uh, second, uh, the unexpected coronavirus happened to play a significant role in having faculty members experience the new technologies available uh, in co incorporation into their lectures. Actually, uh, uh, I talked to many professors uh, recently, and uh, actually they are using, after using this technology, many of them have expressed the need and willingness to uh, you know, utilize more online materials in their so it can be said that crisis has made technology inroads in education. And although it is unfortunate that you know, the world is now uh, experiencing and suffering from the pandemic, unexpected consequences are affecting the educational environment positively. You know, we need to see how this uh, new uh, phenomenon will shape a new uh, uh, educational system. And finally, I think we must take advantage of this opportunity to identify some of the laws and the regulations that hinder a way to much needed disruptive uh, uh, innovation in education. Uh, some laws should, uh, uh, should be revised to create a suitable environment for universities to thrive in the fourth industrial era. How can regulations limit the bread, uh, breathing space or breathing room for creativity? So in conclusion, uh, we all agree in unison that it is time to embrace uh, this disruptive innovation in education, but in reality, we encounter uh, many difficulties when it comes to the question of how and uh, whether the current regulatory, regulatory environment will be supported enough to allow us to pursue such a course. That's my initial comments. Thank you. Thank you, Fred Chan. I think we have a very thoughtful and wise uh, comment from two presidents. Uh, it appears that uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, could be more powerful than two strong leaders <laughs> in uh, inducing uh, professors uh, to go for uh, new edtech and, and online learning. Uh, but, uh, but two presidents also uh, point out that this could be a good opportunity for Korean universities as well as uh, universities worldwide. So uh, we'll come back to uh, two presenters about this issue. Maybe uh, Michael Hong, you go first. Certainly. Uh, so I, I just a couple thoughts off of this. One, the regulatory barriers that you described are very normal uh, across uh, the world, frankly, when disruptive innovation arises. I think your point is very accurate and well taken. Uh, the Typically what disruptors do is they don't try to go head on and change the regulations directly. They try to go around the regulations into parts where they can start to uh, establish themselves uh, in legal ways outside of the regulatory oversight, prove the model, and then change the regulations as they gather uh, resources and proof points and so forth of the effectiveness. So I would imagine in the Korean context, that would mean starting with non-university programs uh, that function with very different sort of actors for allowing universities to create sub-degree or non-degree pathways perhaps that might have uh, more regulatory freedom or perhaps you could uh, change regulations to get more easily to create regulatory freedom. Start there and then uh, start to gain steam and gain learners and then change the regulations across the sector. Uh, is typically how disruptive innovation operates. The second thought is typically when disruptive innovation emerges, it's actually not the case that, the, you know, my stories and, and, and some of what you said <laughs> suggest it's very hard for the leaders to grab onto the disruption and do it themselves. Uh, the, but Southern New Hampshire University is actually a very good example of a university uh, that has managed to do both its brick and mortar traditional learning as well as the disruptive innovation. And every time when we see uh, companies or institutions do this, they set up an autonomous uh, division that has the freedom to rethink the resources, processes, and priorities of the new enterprise, and it's not beholden to the old. We, we for, for sake of time, I'll just say it's called dual transformation where you continue to do what you do today. You don't abandon that. 
Uh, you might even use the technology to do it better in some cases to uh, some of the earlier points and uh, by incorporating it in a hybrid format. And then you create a separate model uh, where you have the freedom to rethink how the education might be delivered in more disruptive ways. And if it works, then you can, uh, you know, uh, provide it with more resources to help it grow. And if it doesn't, it, it hasn't affected your core operation. The third thing I, I just want to point out, because, you know, you both pointed out uh, the value of problem solving on the one hand, uh, and then the problem uh, or, or the importance of developing strong character uh, and uh, learners who are able to think in humane, civic ways and be wonderful citizens of our world, not just uh, people able to get the next job. And I think this is a tremendously important set of points, which is to say it's very easy to think that uh, in the future higher education uh, universities will just focus on helping people get their next job. And I think there will be some set of programs that do that in a very narrow way. Uh, but I also think the core liberal arts education that thinks about who we are as human beings, how we relate to others, uh, and creates people who are hungry for lifelong learning and bettering themselves in society will continue to be extraordinarily important. And when you actually think about a lot of the impact of automation and artificial intelligence, what it will do is commoditize a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, very narrow skills focused on creation of technology, for example, or programming, or, or it'll, it will automate those sorts of things. What it will not be able to do is automate our humanity. And it will not be able, to, and, and, and in many ways, our value add as human beings will be to be able to understand these technologies deeply enough but then to complement them with sense of good character, ethics, how do we use them, philosophical questions, deep strategic questions of, of, of how to use them and so forth. And so I actually think a lot of, you know, you mentioned Minerva. I think it's a wonderful example of really trying to think through what do human beings really need to know and be able to do in the future to sit alongside these technologies that will do routine uh, and automated tasks far better than human beings will. And thinking about the character element of that and the problem solving questions that are who we are as human beings, I, I, I just want to say I, I very much agree with the point and, and think we should not lose sight of that. You go back to uh, Kat, uh, Ms. Kathleen and can I add one question? Uh, you know that we talked about Minerva, and uh, actually they are going global, uh, selling their uh, their own uh, learning pl platforms to uh, to other uh, universities and, and so forth. So uh, one of the feature of uh, the uh, disruptive innovator is, I mean, they are going global, right? So do you have any uh, efforts to go global? Uh, to uh, recruit students abroad for uh, uh, Southern New Hampshire University? Absolutely. One of the programs that our university is doing is called the Global Education Movement, or GEM, and that was a program that was launched a few years ago with grant support, and we're present in five countries delivering our competency-based college for America courses in um, refugee camps, really believing in the power of education to transform lives and offer help getting to that next step in their careers. So that's one example. And we're also expanding our programs globally as well. So and maybe, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, now did you want me to speak to the previous question around synthesizing the exchange amongst the panel? Because I'd love to weigh in on that as well. Um, just echoing some of the points that Michael made previously, I think when we're thinking about innovating at scale and bringing these big changes in the way we teach and help our students learn at a university, 
absolutely starting with pockets of innovation is critical. This is something we were able to do at Southern New Hampshire University um, using our College for America program as an example in which we were able to create a separate innovation lab and build a small competency-based education program that over the years has grown. And that's something we're able to offer our students. And I would also echo Michael's excellent points around the fact that when we're thinking about the skills that we're teaching our learners, right, the high tech cutting edge skills of being able to work side by side with um, human machines, um, artificial intelligence, things of that nature, really those human skills are what are so critical, those soft, so-called soft skills or professional skills, whatever you want to call them, we firmly believe that those are the foundation of helping our future learners be successful. And that includes being good citizens, being a positive presence in the world. Uh, dear Kathleen, uh, maybe we have uh, a short a second round discussion. So, uh, to present, do you have any, uh, anything to add or okay. comment? Uh, okay, I have to. Uh, emphasizes in the future, the collaboration and interaction of the university, academy, and the industry, and society become more and more important. Mm -hmm. And uh, emphasize problem finding and problem solution is important. Uh, to find the good problems, and uh, you must interact mm -hmm. uh, real uh, industry problems finding the industry problem, so I like to emphasize, so, uh, you know, uh, interaction of the academy and the industry become more, much more important, and, you know, so the success, I, I mentioned the uh, Apple 42 uh, Academy in Paris, they don't have any professor, but they have a strong collaboration mm -hmm. in the industry, so maybe, so that's why in the future, uh, you should do some, uh, you know, innovation tools. Mm -hmm. How you must uh, make the more collaboration mm -hmm. of uh, of the university and, uh, industry mm -hmm. more successful. Mm -hmm. So that's the you know uh, key issue, and uh, then you know there will be the big uh, innovation in economy mm -hmm. and uh, also in education. Actually, I found the, uh, the example of Southern New Hampshire University's innovation center working with Google in finding out uh, the, the, uh, the solution of, of teaching and learning. So, uh, the friend John, do you have any uh, plan or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, policy to work with uh, Korean education, for example, to, to, uh, to, uh, to think about uh, the, the, the learning uh, solution? Uh, because I mean, the, the, the learning is also uh, confined by uh, the, the, the regional context or national context. Mm -hmm. and so maybe, uh, and also we, have, we do have very good, uh, vi uh, vibrant uh, educate companies uh, nowadays. So uh, any, any plan or any policy? Yeah, for the, for the, uh, for the time being, mm -hmm. okay, uh, I'm, I'm cooperating with the, our city. Oh, okay. So maybe uh, our city uh, in the Pohang, you are located in Pohang, so Handong University and Pohang City, mm -hmm. uh, you talk a lot, what's the real problems mm -hmm. in Pohang City? Mm -hmm. So then Pohang City give you a, you, uh, us the problem, mm -hmm. then uh, our lecture class, our class will uh, uh, discuss okay. and uh, solve, the, uh, solve the problem of Pohang University. So this is the day you identify 20 problems of the fun oh, city. That's impressive. So uh, for instance, they do, uh, you talked about the, uh, the regulation, uh, the, the cap of uh, 20%, so you cannot exceed, your online class cannot exceed 20%, but actually the, the, the Ministry of Education recently uh, lifted the bar because they, because then the, temporarily. Yeah, temporarily. But uh, I expect that uh, they are going to come back to the, uh, the past after coronavirus, uh, 
coming back to 20% or maybe uh, they could compromise because and uh, as uh, uh, friend Jansun already pointed out, some professors, uh, they, they like the uh, online learning <laughs> and, and students actually enjoy uh, online learning. So why, why uh, we have to go back to the, the past, right? Maybe 20% uh, could be uh, increased to 40% or 50% so that uh, provide more room for online learning and, and, and or hybrid uh, learning. So, um, I'm not from the government side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, would, what would, yeah. they would do mm -hmm. after, after this high coronavirus comes to an end? But I think we have to propose uh, mm -hmm. to the government that you know we have to increase the exactly. percentage yeah. up to fifty percent or sixty percent. I don't uh -huh. know. Uh -huh. uh, but I think you know uh, going back to uh, you know, disruptive innovation in education. You know, we I think we have a lot to learn from the business sector. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are talking about you know we are living in the uh, era of a shared economy. Mm -hmm. And the Uber and the Airbnb is the, you know, is the prime uh, examples of this uh, uh, shared economy. And I think and, you know today's topic is not, of course, shared economy, but uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, shared uh, you know, uh, economy uh, concept in education as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in our example, you know, we our university uh, you know, had a strong partnership with the Asian universities. Mm -hmm. So in 2014. About 80 some uh, Asian universities got together and we established a, a new platform called uh, Global Access Asia. Uh, this is kind of an uh, online uh, platform. Oh. So each participating university is contributing at least one uh, you know, online course mm -hmm. uh, to the system. Uh, so this is basically a shared uh, economy concept. So, for example, uh, our university, North University, don't have to hire. Indonesian uh, tourism specialist uh, at our university because we can utilize uh, our partner uh, experts uh, uh, in, in Indonesia. So by doing that, uh, we can reduce the significant cost, but we can also uh, exchange with uh, credit hours as well. So um, in shared economic uh, era, uh, economic era, we don't know we uh, no longer need uh, have to have everything at our university. Uh, I call it assembly university. So we can assemble already available uh, sources, mm -hmm. resources outside to make them uh, available to our students. So this is another area uh, which we should explore uh, to pursue our um, disruptive innovation in education. Yeah. That's quite an interesting example. So uh, because of limited time, maybe we have to wrap up. Uh, uh, we will first uh, ask uh, two uh, speakers. Um, if you have any final thoughts or uh, remarks, please go ahead. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go briefly, but just to say, I, I think based on the comments that uh, you all have made over there, you are in good hands. Uh, and, and I am encouraged, uh, as always, with the inquisitive nature uh, of uh, Korean culture uh, to ask the right questions and find the right solutions uh, for Korea. You all have deep expertise, I would argue, in disrupting, uh, and it's now a manner of using it in the education system to fuel not just uh, lifelong learning in Korea, but frankly, there's an opportunity to export that more broadly uh, and serve a wider swath of humanity, which I think will be exciting. Uh, Ms. Uh, Kathleen, do you have Certainly. any <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Yes, I think there's so much to discuss about innovation in higher education, particularly disruptive innovation and how the current moment brings much to bear around the future of online learning and new emerging technologies and how might we improve the educational system together. I think this has been such a fabulous, rich discussion, and I'm so thankful for being able to be part of it, exchanging ideas with you all. I think there's a lot of promise and a lot of potential, and I look forward to what's next. So we we'll turn to uh, to uh, discuss for that for final. <laughs> so, okay, uh, definitely we need uh, disruption, in, disruptive innovation in higher education, and uh, we will make. 
disruption, disruptive innovation in higher education. Okay, ironically, you know, uh, we talked about coronavirus, and that will uh, push, you know, uh, broad societal shift and bring about industry-wide disruption for sure. So a new normal is coming around the corner, uh, and I think uh, we will soon begin to notice a new player or a new disruptor uh, in our market. And uh, disruptor will open a new chapter in higher education. So I truly hope the Korean universities are up for the challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes uh, session three. I particularly thank you uh, the, uh, the, uh, the speakers abroad. Uh, I think your time, local time is now <laughs> very late. And thank you for joining us at late time. Thank you very much. I think I have to make a uh, final uh, uh, closing remark of all three sessions. So just a wait a second. Uh, so uh, in the middle of the rampant uh, spread of the coronavirus, we have had a very uh, productive and galvanizing session exploring a paradigm shift in education through AI and online learning platforms. I think this is what education is all about. Nothing can stop progress in learning. TV Joseon will be hosting uh, the Global Leaders Forum in November late this year, hopefully after the end of coronavirus pandemic. I am certain that today's conference has, had a, has laid a very solid foundation for this upcoming larger event with a broader scope. As the chairperson of the Education Commission Asia, I am very excited that we were able to co-host the Global Forum with TV Joseon. We thank all the speakers and discussants uh, for participating and giving us the wonderful speeches, presentations, and discussions. And, and to the 200 more audience members uh, paying attention and staying with us, throughout all sessions for more than five hours. Please uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>